So we're in uh, 1 Samuel 19 this evening, and um, you know, I gotta tell you, you ladies who love uh, Hallmark and Lifetime, you don't think that that stuff holds a candle to the Bible, man. In fact, I think they stole all their ideas from the Bible. Wait till you see the story tonight. It's like it reads, you know, they stole all this stuff from there. Anyway, let's go ahead and read some of this, and um, we'll see where the Lord will have me stop reading, and then we'll pray. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you, therefore... Please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and I'll stand beside my father in the field where you are and I will speak to my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant against David because he has not sinned against you and because of his works or because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and uh, you, you, excuse me. He brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without cause? And so Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Let's pray. Lord, we just do thank you again for the many lessons uh, and observations and uh, just things that we can glean and apply to our lives that you feed us so richly with the food of your word and the truth of your word. And um, Lord, help these things to sink in to each of us personally, Lord, not just that we learn about you and about the Bible, but that the Bible would have study of us, that we would be found, and what things that we don't know, even about ourselves, we would see. Lord, ultimately, you know, you're the one that needs to do the work in us. So we, any, any work we attempt to do without your help will be in vain. And so we don't want to build in vain. And so, Lord, we're hoping that you'll build the house. And Lord, strengthen us as a church, as, you know, so many different things going on in our midst, Lord. We just need to, to be strong together. Lord, and, and it is uh, the purpose for, for which this church exists is to a group of people that worship together and um, help each other face life together and in a way that honors you and brings glory to your name. So we're, we're here to, 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 to make a name for you tonight. Help us to do that in Jesus' name, amen. So it's, it's hard to understand and consequently, it's also hard to explain uh, these kinds of biblical stories. Like, for example, God permitted for there to be a King Saul in the first place. You know, you scratch your head. Well, why would God even allow that? There's, see, God doesn't do anything without purpose or reason. And so anything that God permits, you have to then ask yourself, well, why? And what can we learn from it? So we've seen a lot of mistakes that Saul has made. Uh, Saul was very much uh, interested in himself and in his position and his image in the world. Um, the people looked favorably upon him because in, in his appearance and how he appeared to people, to, to them he appeared to be the logical leader for them. And, and it was their very wrong heart in the beginning that caused them even to seek for a human king. They remember they said to Samuel that... Uh, Make us a king, remember, like the other nations. Rather than wanting to model their community after heaven, they wanted to model their community like other human communities. That's their mistake. That's how they ended up desiring Saul. And it broke Samuel's heart that they would want such a thing. And God had to say to Samuel, permit it. It's, it's not you they're rejecting, Samuel. Samuel, a great man of God, a great prophet, uh, just distressed at the desire of the people and that they did not want, God said, they're, they're rejecting not you, they're rejecting me. They did not want God to rule over them. Now, let's just briefly consider that for a second. What's the difference? 
to, to let God be your king. And by the way, the same, it's the same call for us today. God must rule our, our community, the church, and our lives as individuals. He must be our king. But, but think about the difficulty of that. It's not like he's here for us to go talk to him. It's not like he has a position or a place in the world where people are afraid of him and we can go and, and take advantage of his protection. And so from a human point of view, we're gonna look to very materialistic and human things to provide for ourselves, to protect ourselves. Uh, you know, we're gonna get emotionally at times involved in very temporal things, things that are not eternal in nature. And because of that, it's hard for us to trust God, isn't it? Right, if we're honest. So, and, and I think one of the most important synonyms to the word faith is trust. If you really wanna define your own faith and really uh, scrutinize your faith in Jesus, in God, ask yourself how you're doing trusting him with the everyday problems of this life and world. Uh, we see in the person of Saul something of a compromise. Uh, you know, yes, we want someone to represent us as a nation, someone to, to lead us and when we need to go to war, someone to defend us, someone to make us prosper and all those things. And, and Samuel even warned them, this is what's gonna happen. If you have a king, the king is gonna require your sons to serve in, your, in battle and to do this, that, and the other thing. As an alternative, God could have fought all their battles, but they, they went away from that. Instead of God's way, they, 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 something less than that. And God was still with them. God still loved them. But they wanted a human king. They wanted to be like the other nations. The problem is, is the more we want to be like the rest of the world, the more the world will see us as no different than them. And it is our confidence in God and our faith in God and our willingness to let God run our lives that sets us apart from other people. In other words, when we trust God against all human reason, it sets us apart from other people because other people don't live that way. It really makes faith stand out. And the difference between the one, the second king of Israel, technically the third, but you guys know who Ish, Ishbosheth is? Ishbosheth, remember him? So when Saul dies, uh, Saul's general grabs this guy, Ishbosheth, and says, All right, you're going to be king of Israel. And for two years, behind the scenes, the general tells him everything to say and do. And it's really the general behind the scenes, right? So, you know, if, if you look up Ishbosheth in the dictionary, there's a picture of Joe Biden there. <laughs> if you didn't know that. Maybe you don't have the same dictionary as me, I don't know, but. Whatever. <laughs> but David, interestingly enough, the difference or distinction between Saul and David is their trust in God. They both knew the Bible. They both knew, what I mean by the Bible, they both knew the Mosaic law. They both knew the story of Abraham. They both knew the creation model. They both knew who God was and they knew his laws. One took God at his word and believed it, and the other said, well, yeah, that stuff is true, but I have the ability to interpret that and apply it however it makes sense to me in my life. And I'm gonna make God fit the circumstances the way I see them, and I'll do things my way and bring God with me. He's lucky to have me, after all. <laughs> that was Saul's mentality. Boy, I'll tell you what. You, if you don't think the church does that, just do yourself a favor and find listings where churches are trying to hire pastors. Look at the qualifications to be a pastor at churches today. We have to have an MDiv with this, that, or the other thing. You need this education and that and this, that. You know what? If you, the vast majority of churches, the requirements to be a pastor at those churches... Jesus doesn't qualify. <laughs> fact. That's a fact. In fact, the only one who does it amongst the apostles would be probably Paul. 
It's really, really ridiculous. What, what, what the emphasis should be on is a calling from God and an anointing and a gifting. Because if there aren't those things and there's an education, my, my poor sister and brother-in-law, their pastor retired, had to step down. He retired. His wife was very ill. He decided to just, he was done. He was tired. And they were, man, they were so, it was a good pastor, such momentum. They had, I don't know how many, hundreds and hundreds of people. They built a $5 million addition, a big sanctuary on the building. It was almost done. And he says, you know what, guys, I can't go anymore. His wife had just passed away and he was spent. So they form a pastoral search committee. And this discussion ensues amongst the congregation as to what values were most important. And the people who won the argument were the ones who wanted doctorates. Oh, we want someone who has their doctorate. And they ended up with a guy that has two doctorates. The church now is less than 20% in attendance of what it was. He's driven everyone away. My sister and brother-in-law and a whole bunch of people went to several of the other churches in the area. And the place is just going downhill. The emphasis, on, I'm telling you this happens more than you want to, than you want, want to know. But you know what, in this church, we didn't have a lot of money, so you ended up with me. <laughs> well, that's your lack of discernment. <laughs> and if there's one thing that I could say about us as a church and our leadership is that we really just want to make Jesus known. Like, none of us are here to make a name for ourselves. That's not why we're here. We know that. The uh, motto of this church is um, we provide worship services that lead to what, worship lifestyles. Worship services that lead to worship lifestyles. You live your lives obedient to God. That's what, that wor- that's what it means. You worship God with your life. And so we want to be more like David. Now, here's what's fascinating. Let's get into this passage. I think... We, we sit here and we think, why would God call David to replace Saul? And, and then we have this character in Saul who's dangerous. He's just dangerous. God has removed his spirit from him. He has this disturbing satanic or demonic spirit manipulating him. Now, what does God do? Brings David, the next king, into Saul's life as a very important part. You think to yourself, why, God, would you do that? If there's a difference between these two, wouldn't you keep them separate? Again, God doesn't think like us. His ways, you know, our, his ways are so far beyond ours finding out. But the question, I mean, if you think about it, this disturbing spirit, how many times, in fact, today we're going to see it again, Saul's trying to kill David. First, he, well, you're going to see here, he tries to kill him with the spear, Another way he tries to kill him is by getting him married. (laughs) Well, to his daughter, I mean. But it's interesting because Saul's son becomes this anointed friend of David, where they're like best friends and they have each other's back and it's like, you know, brothers from other mothers, it's like they're inseparable and, and they have a like-mindedness. And again, the connection to Saul, the connection to Saul, it's like God keeps bringing David into Saul's life and you que- you're like, why would you do that? And I think the better question is this. What would David be like without the Saul experience? That's the real question. Because everything God allows in David's life made him the man that he eventually became when he was king. And so what did, Saul, what did David learn from all that exposure to Saul? Not to be Saul. And so when we are exposed to people and things that are like that in our lives, and we say, why, Lord, are you allowing this in my life? Why have you allowed this person in my life like this? Just know that God has meaning and purpose for it and that he will change you into what he's making you into to prepare you for some things in the future. You might not know what those things are and you're better off not knowing. (laughs) 
<laughs> sufficient to the, for the, the troubles today are sufficient for, for themselves. Don't worry about tomorrow. Be anxious for nothing. With everything, prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God, and he'll take care of you. And that's just the introduction. We haven't even started the message yet. Okay. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Quite blunt. Now I ask you, have you complained about your in-laws lately? I mean, David has better cause to complain about his than you do of yours. I mean, they might say that they wish you were dead, but Saul actually can kill David, you know? But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. From David's point of view, it's great having somebody that close to the number one source of his danger. And yet, at the same time, he knows he's called to Saul's life there's a spiritual calling within the life of Saul that David's called to. He can't help that. He knows that. And at the same time, he's got David on the inside helping him. See, God's going to keep everything the way it's supposed to be, keep David alive. It's God who kept David alive. We're looking at very natural circumstances. Michael, Saul's daughter, helps keep him alive in this chapter. Jonathan helps keep him alive in this chapter. But it was God using those relationships to do that. Everything is manipulated here for God's great purpose. And the relationship with Jonathan was important, not just to David, but to Saul also, because Jonathan is the son of Saul, and as such is there to remind Saul of who Saul should have been. Jonathan is who Saul should have been. A man who takes God at his word. When Jonathan said, look, there's the camp of the Philistines. Let's go attack them and see what might happen. What was Jonathan counting on? God's word, God's promise that he was one of the, his special people and God would protect them and defeat their enemies. The odds were so overwhelmingly against him. Twice he did this. And this is the same character of David, to take God at his word. Again, that's trust. Amen to you too. Amen to you too. That's trust. When you trust God, you step out in faith. You step out in faith, not because you're testing God, but because you believe God. You just know that, listen, it might, go, it might not go just the way I think, but God's in it. If God's in it, I want to be in it. And so to Saul, Jonathan had to be an example of what he should have been like the lack of his heart of faith. Jonathan had that. And to David, he had to be someone to help defend him and to provide legitimacy to the calling on David's life. See, Jonathan's testimony kept the truth in order for us to read today. Jonathan was on the inside. That's how we know what D Saul's plot was because God had Jonathan there. It's fascinating to consider it. Look at verse two. So Jonathan told David, saying, my father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then when I observe, I will, what I observe, I will tell you. We have both advocacy in Jonathan and we have opportunity opportunity to affect a change and advocacy on behalf of David before Saul. Like he's going to speak on David's behalf to Saul. That's advocacy. And we do the same, don't we? We defend Christ in circles that are against him. And there are those who defend us in circles that are against us. And, and it's something that God does. And then yet at the same time, we have this accountability that comes uh, the opportunity to bring accountability where we hold people to truth. Now, Jonathan is going to say here, David's no threat to you. Th something inside of you is telling you something that's not right. That's what he's going to say to his father. So look at verse 2. Jonathan's told David, my father seeks to kill you. And this information is how David stays alive. Look at verse four. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. Now as they stand in the field, Jonathan speaking to his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant. Number one, he's calling it sin. 
He's bringing attention to the fact that Saul's plan to kill David is sin against God. The thing that you desire to do is wrong against God. And then he says, against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you. There is cause in the old covenant where, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, you have this, the law of, of, uh, of retribution. And so you could make an argument, although wrongly, that, you know, if somebody has taken something from you, you have the right to take something against them. It's covered in the 613 commandments. And, and here, you know, Jonathan is saying, David hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't blasphemed. There's no cause for you to, to kill him. Uh, and because his works have been good toward you. The second reason is not only hasn't he done anything wrong against you, but he's actually done good for you. See, uh, the proper or the true perspective is that David just makes you look better, Saul, because he is serving you. He serves under you. He's part of your military. But when anybody, you know, people who struggle with, with wanting themselves to be seen as the popular one or the leader uh, don't like it when the focus or the attention or the love is on somebody else. Even if that person's under them, they begin to see them as a threat. Uh, recently, um, I had somebody say, don't you worry that, you know, some, somebody's gonna come along and uh, you know, steal your job eventually or something? I said, absolutely not. They can have it. <laughs> you know, the longer you do the job that I do, the more you realize it's God who put me here. And if God wants me to go on or leave, that's his business. You know, I'm, I, I, don't, I can't worry about that. I don't have enough time to worry about that stuff. I'm here to just do what, it, today, I'm here. You guys want to fire me? Let me know. Well, you should let me know 10 minutes ago. So I don't, whatever. Saul's worried about his reputation. He cares about what people think too much rather than what God thinks. It's because he doesn't trust God. If, if, if he really trusted God, he would have repented for the sin of the past. And by the way, that's the, that's the continuous story here. God is trying to get Saul to repent. That's why Jonathan's telling him the truth. David hasn't been done, done anything wrong to you. Verse five, for he took his life, he, he risked his own life when he went against the Philistine, the giant, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance. Notice the emphasis on who did it through David. The Lord brought about a great victory for all Israel because David was willing to step out in faith while the rest of the Israeli army stood on the hill and watched in fear. For days on end, they were unwilling to go out against Goliath. It took David to simply say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Well, we know that about 200 of them in last chapter got circumcised against their will. Remember that? Uh, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he come against the army of the living God. What does that tell you? It tells you that David saw the Israeli military as God's people, there to serve God and defending God's nation. It's still debated over today. <laughs> David understood it. We understand it. God's people are God's people. I, yes, thank you, Terry. Now I feel so much more secure in my belief. Good thing you said that. The Lord brought a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and you rejoiced, Saul. Why then do you sin against innocent blood to kill David without cause? Without cause, notice those words. You have no cause. Your perspective is incorrect. Telling his father that there's something inside of you that's not serving you well. How many times do we have to hear that from the Lord? There's something inside of us that's not serving us well from, a, from an eternal or a biblical point of view. Verse six, so Saul heeded the voice of his son, Jonathan, and Saul then swore, as the Lord lives, David shall not be killed. So Jonathan called David. Jonathan told him all these things. And so Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was 
sort of restored to the presence as in past times. Just like when that disturbing spirit first started to come emerge into Saul's life, the, the advice of the elders was bring about someone who plays well on an instrument to soothe you, and David was brought. In other words, they brought a worship leader in and the presence of God through ministry of worship and music was brought into Saul's life. And whenever David would play, the disturbing spirit would leave Saul alone and calm his spirit. But, but see, De Saul is battling here. Which, which way am I gonna be drawn? To the leadership of God through David or to the leadership of the disturbing spirit for my own pride's sake? Ultimately, that's a battle that he ends up giving into the, his own pride. And so, verse eight, it's temporary here, but it's welcome. There was war again. See, that's the change. And we, we know for us today, this is more spiritual, right? This war, this battle, than anything else. There's war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. This is the very thing that was the beginning of the provocation between Saul and David was the popularity. Remember the song the women sang when they returned from battle? Saul has sl slain his... David has slain his tens of thousands. You know, viva la David, the short guy, short little handsome guy. And what happens next? The distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in the house with his spear in his hand and David was playing his music in his, in his hand. One's got a guitar in his hand. Oh, it might say a harp in some translations, but actually that instrument was nothing like what we would think of as a harp. If you're Irish, you think you know what a harp is. <laughs> that's, one of, that's one of their symbols, I think, on their flag. But this was more like a guitar than it was what we would consider a harp. That was what was in David's hand. An instrument of praise and an instrument of war was in the hand of Saul. And so Saul then sought to pin David to the wall. Why? Well, he just got back from war and he's getting more glory and more credit that Saul thinks should be his. He sought to pin David to the wall with the spear. Uh, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall so David fled and escaped that night. You see, Saul might have had a little bit of a victory in that he heard the voice of God and listened to it through his son Jonathan. But if you don't then follow up with preparation for the soon coming temptation, then you will give in and return back to what caused you to be off in the first place. So it's like, you know what? You listen to the voice of God, you respond to the voice of God, you then need to follow up with worship for the, you know, and keep on that practice of the presence of God, practicing the presence of God, seeking the presence of God in your life. And God will bless you with protection from your own selfish and sinful desires. And so as David was playing his music, Saul threw the spear at him. So Saul went or Saul sent messengers to David's house <clears throat> to watch him and to kill him in the morning. But Saul's daughter, Michael, David's wife, told David, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. And so this is her saying, you need to, you need to get out of here. Now it's interesting, flip over for a second, if you don't mind, to Psalm 59, Psalm 59. And if you read in Psalm 59, the uh, inscription of above the psalm, this is a, an editor's note. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And above the psalm, it says, a mictum of David when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. <laughs> so this is what this psalm is about. It's a mictum of David about the very moment that we're reading about here in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 19. Let's read it together. It says in Psalm 59, deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. Save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me. 
Not for my transgressions, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. Awake to help me, and behold, you therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. Pray. You ever, did you ever, ever realize it's okay to, to pray that way? <laughs> If I can quote David in another psalm, he says, break their teeth, Lord. <laughs> At evening they return, they growl like a dog, and they go around the city. Indeed, they belch with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, for they say, who hears? But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. I will wait for you. O you, his strength. For God is my defense. Think about this, what he's saying here. This is what he's writing in the response to Saul's spies seeking to kill him. The CIA, the FBI, Comey. <laughs> Epstein learned the hard way. <laughs> My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. Do not slay them lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power. Bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the works of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for the cursing and lying which they speak, consume them in their wrath. Consume them that they may not be and let them know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth, Selah. And at evening they return, they growl like a dog and go all around the city and they wander up and they go down for food and howl if they are not satisfied. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning for you have been my defense and my refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. It's interesting that he's writing this right after he was in the presence of Saul with a guitar in his hand, while Saul had a spear in his hand and sought to kill him. And he becomes aware of this plot through who? Saul's daughter, his wife. Again, God has his ministers and so verse 12, back to our chapter now, chapter 19, verse 12, First Samuel. So Michael let David down through a window and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image. Now you might want to note that word there, image. More on that in a second. Took an image and laid it in his bed, but a, put a cover of goat's hair for his head and covered it with clothes. So when Saul sent messengers to take David. She said he's sick. Now it may be true, and it is true, that Michael was character-wise more like her father than Jonathan, her brother. She loved David. She definitely loved David. Character-wise, we see some, some Saul-like personality in her. More on that in a second. Listen to this, verse 15. So Saul sent messengers back to her house, to David's house, to see David, saying, well, if he's sick, bring him up to me in his bed that I might kill him. Well, that's a nice thought, Dad. And when the messengers had come in, there was, and there's that word again, right? Image in the bed with the cover of goat's hair for his head. So this word is the word uh, uh, teraphim, which is the Hebrew word for idol. And so, you know, I can't imagine that if in fact this is an, an, an idol, an image of something that's an idol, it's being laid in a bed to trick people to think David's laying in the bed. So it's similar to the size of a human. And then she took goat's hair to up near where the head would be and to lay that over it to make it seem like it was real hair. And so, you know, obviously she's, she's trying to deceive people so that David can escape. He needed time to get away. Um, but if this is some kind of idol, it should never have been in the house in the first place. And whose was it and why is it there, if in fact it is an idol? In 2 Samuel chapter 6, 
beginning in verse 16, we see another side of Michael. In fact, this is a story you might be more familiar with from her life in her marriage with David. This is much later on. It go, this is how verse 16 through maybe about eight, eight verses here. As the ark of the Lord, David is having the ark of the Lord being brought into, back into the house of the Lord, came to the city of David. Michael, here she is again, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And so they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then, verse 19, he dis he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, with women and the men, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So that it sounds like a Jersey Shore Calvary Chapel Wednesday night. <laughs> so all the people departed, everyone to his house. So David returned to bless his household, his own house. And Michael, notice that in this chapter, in Samuel, it's always not just Michael, David's wife. It's Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David, and this is what she says to him. Not, wow, honey, I'm so excited. The Ark of the Covenant, the worship of the people, it's all coming together. She says, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids and servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. She was embarrassed by him, more worried about peop what people thought than what God thought. Oh, well, David brings correction in verse 21. He says, David said to Michael, it was, it was before the Lord. It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler of the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord and I will be even more undignified than this. Amen. Good job, Terry. <laughs> and will be humble in my own sight, but as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. In other words, what you see as undignified, God sees as unbridled, unfettered worship of God. And I think sometimes we could learn a lesson from David in this. Michael certainly needed to learn it. I don't know the fate or the sanctification or transformation of her spiritual life. I know she loved David, but I know she had a little Saul in her, right? And that rubbed David the wrong way. Back to our story, verse 17. So Saul said to his daughter, Michael, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, here she lies to her father. She's speaking of David when she says, he said to me, let me go, why should I kill you? She's telling her father that David, my husband, threatened to kill me if I didn't let him go. That's a blatant lie. She loved him enough to save his life and get him out of there, but then she, had, she didn't have enough faith to tell her father the truth, like Jonathan did. See, Jonathan did just the opposite of this. He said, dude, you're wrong. <laughs> you're just wrong. He has done nothing wrong to you. He made you look good, and you want to kill him? That's a sin against God. That's what Jonathan did. On the other hand, Michael did not have that boldness or courage to put herself in the hands of God rather than trusting her father or manipulating her father. Anyway, verse 18, David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah. And he told, he told him, that is Samuel, all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Nioth. So Nioth was... Uh, it's not like a real prominent place on your Bible maps. You have to search for that. But it was somewhere in, I think just probably to the north of Ramah. And it was there, we believe, that this school was set up by Samuel. See, several chapters ago, Samuel came to the conclusion that there was no further use for him to be uh, in Saul's life. 
as a prophet, as a priest, as a minister. Because Saul had, has now beyond that. There's no hope for Saul as king anymore. God has shifted his focus and his anointing on David. And so as far as Saul was concerned, uh, Samuel knew that God was done with Saul. Not in terms of working on him for his own personal salvation, but in terms of God's support of his spirit on an anointing, the spirit of God and the anointing of Saul as king, God was done with him. So Samuel left, went to Ramah to his house, and then started this school of ministry, a school of ministry where he trained people to do some of the same things he was gifted and called to do. And that's exactly what he needed to do because he needed to raise up more people to take over for him when he was done. And that's what we should be doing as well. And so he says here, he and Samuel went out and they stayed at Nioth. And now it was told Saul, saying, take note, David is at Nioth in Ramah. So then Saul sent messengers, and this is my favorite part of the whole story, these last ending verses, sent messengers with the intention that they would take David and kill him and bring him back to him to be killed. And when they saw, listen, they saw the group of prophets prophesying. What does that sound like to you? A worship service. This is a bunch of people trained to worship the Lord in prophecy. Listen, now, you might not have a clear understanding of what pro biblical prophecy is, but the primary meaning of biblical prophecy has to do with proclamation, proclaiming truth, praising God in words of truth, and speaking the truth of God to people. That's what prophets did. The truth is a, often a very unpopular thing. <laughs> In fact, what did, Pilate, what did Pilate say? What is truth? That's a politician answer, by the way. Ishbosheth. See Biden. What is truth? I love that movie Shooter. Have you ever seen that movie Shooter? Uh, it's a, it, yeah, he's a sniper. Right, and, and there's a scene where Ned Beatty, who plays the politician, is sitting in a cabin with Danny Glover, I think it is. Yes, yeah. And these two think they've gotten away with everything, blaming the sniper for an assassination that they planned and did. And Ned Beatty famously, as he's sitting by the fire with a cigar and a glass of whiskey, says, laughing while he says it, truth is what I say it is. That's a politician sure that believed that they can spin a lie so that everyone will believe it and they get to decide what is true and what is not true. You know the next thing that happens? The next thing that happens is the cabin blows up with them in it. It's coming. The cabin's gonna blow up soon. Don't worry about anything, God's got this. God's got it all. He knows every lie. Amen. You can drop your pen over that. That's fine. I'm okay with that. So here's David. What is David? Where does David go? To the prophet and to the school of ministry to worship God with them, to the people who will speak truth because that's what he needed most in this time of fear was to hear more truth. Where do we go when the world's telling us to be afraid? To the place that tells us the truth. We're not shutting down again, ever. <laughs> now it was told to Saul, saying, take note, David's at Nioth in Ramah. So he sent messengers. Check out what happens. Saul sent messengers to take David when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel, the, the lead prophet, standing as leader over them. Uh, the Spirit of God, listen, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they began to prophesy. It's like, what's going on here? The ones who are operating on orders based on lies are being forced to speak glorious truths by the power and presence of God. They came to catch David, and God caught them. 
This isn't a, a testimony about their godliness. They're not godly. It's a testimony to the Spirit's power. Now, this, this may be one of the very few mentions anywhere in Scripture of the Spirit taking control over somebody against or without their cooperation, against their will or without their cooperation. We don't see that very often. But in this situation, it's defensive. It's not like it's an act of worship necessarily. They're being brought under the control of the Spirit for the purpose of a defense of David. And the truth is being told because of the presence of the Spirit. That's what we want. Verse 21, and when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, second wave of CIA, FBI, <laughs> and they prophesied likewise. So Saul yet sent a third wave of spies, and they prophesied also. It's interesting how the emphasis of prophecy is on the proclamation of truth and the enemies of God depend so heavily upon lies to accomplish their will. And they're being forced here to speak and admit and confess truth. I love that. You can't get anything done lying when God's involved. And so then when Saul was told, verse 21, he sent the other messengers and they prophesied, verse 22, then he, Saul, went to Ramah and came to the great well that is in Seku. And so he asked at the well, he said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are at Nioth and Ramah. And so he went to Nioth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went, he went on and prophesied until he came to Nioth in Ramah. He's being forced to tell the truth to himself as he arrives at the place where David and Samuel are. This must be driving him crazier. Who's, so, who's ever seen the movie Liar, Liar? That's what's going on here. He can't lie. No matter how hard he tries, he can't lie. Because the Spirit of God's got him telling the truth. And that's not the worst. Look at verse, look at 24. He also stripped off his clothes and prophesied in the presence of Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all the day and all the night. Now, the nakedness is likely, according to the commentators, it's not a nakedness like we might think or some of you might enjoy to do on your own private time. Don't tell me about it if you do. This would be more like what David did in 2 Samuel where he's down to what we would call his undergarment, right? Would somebody say skivvies? I haven't heard that one in a while. That's a good one, skivvies, down to your skivvies, yeah. Uh, and so he's being forced to be, what, what is this a picture of? Well, first of all, what garments would Saul be wearing? Royal garments. And the presence and the overwhelming presence of the spirit that's forcing truth upon him causes him to take off his royal garments because they're not rightly his. It's not just about humiliation, it's about the truth. He can't even bear to wear the royal garments because it's a lie. And every time we put on our stuff that we intend to force people to think what we want them to think about us, God knows the truth. And so therefore they said, is Saul also among the prophets? Again, the perception of the people. The perception of the people. Because they, they don't know yet the whole truth. But Samuel certainly includes that, is what the people were saying. And that's not the first time they said it about him. It was all the way back in chapter 10 was the first time that God uh, did that through him and he spoke that way. Anyway, that's our story for tonight. We're, running, we're out of time. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna close in prayer and then we'll share uh, prayer requests some praise reports and uh, anything else pertinent to uh, the, what the Lord's doing in our lives and we'll see, see what we have, all right? Lord, we thank you so much for tonight and your word, which gives us so much courage, Lord, in the face of the things going on in the world, and we can trust you. 
And it's our hope that you would help us and strengthen us to trust you the way David did, the way Jonathan did. Lord, um, we thank you for what faith we have, but Lord, we don't want to be content with the faith we have. We want more faith, so would you please strengthen us in our faith? Give us more faith. And Lord, uh, when difficulty comes, when difficult people arise and circumstances seem insurmountable, Lord, we pray that you, like you did in David's life, would do in ours as we learn to trust you and let you work things out in your way that we could see your good works and, Lord, give you great glory for them. Let us never take credit for things that you do. Let us give you all honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 